verses 6 and verse 7. Romans 2, 6 and 7. He will render to each one according to his works, to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. Good evening. Hope that stays. Mike, what version were you reading from? English Standard. English Standard. I have my English Standard tonight. No wonder we were on the same page. I almost always have the New King James Version, but tonight I chose the ES. Romans chapter 2, the text is actually verse number 7, or part of verse number 7, if I can find it. These pages are not in the same place as mine, in my King James Version. These are on different sides of everything. Good evening. <laughs> um, First, I don't believe we have any visitors with us tonight, but if you feel as though you are a visitor, uh, please know that we are honored to have you visiting with us tonight, and we pray that you will be edified in our worship to God this evening. There is an old saying, God give me patience, and I want it now. Patience. I don't know if I am the only one struggling with patience. From time to time in all of our lives, we struggle with patience. We as Christians should be overcoming that. As you grow in your faith and knowledge of the Word of God, your patience should be increasing. Should be increasing. I'm going to read verse 7 of Romans chapter 2. To those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. We see at times in our lives when we fail to exhibit this patience and it happens for many different reasons Lynette was speaking with Jill last night Jill has a lot of patience because from the time that Gloria was brought in to St. Mary's until the time they saw a doctor, not a nurse, not a nurse practitioner, but a doctor was seven hours. I don't have, there'd have been a doctor in there if that were my mother much faster than seven hours or they would have had to escort me out of the facility. There's a time for patience, but there's also a time where we have to make known the severity of a situation. So, in the, man, don't know the name of the movie. Okay, you guys gotta work with me. Morgan Freeman is playing God and Steve Carell is like Moses, and he's told to build an ark. Bruce it's not Bruce Almighty. It's another one where Morgan Freeman's God. <clears throat> and Steve Carell's wife in the movie leaves, 
because she ran out of patience with him. She's at a diner, and the person serving her is Morgan Freeman. She doesn't know Morgan Freeman is God. And he asked her what is wrong, and she said, I need patience. And his response was, if you're praying for patience, God is going to give you opportunities to be patient. When we pray for patience, look for opportunities that are going to test your patience. Because he is giving you that opportunity that you prayed for, for patience. So what are some reasons people lose patience? There are some reasons that people lose patience. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17. Pray without ceasing. Now, we know that that doesn't mean literally every second of every day. That's an impossibility. So what does it mean to pray without ceasing? We should be a people of prayer. We should be praying all the time. Praying to God for the blessings that he's given us. Praying to God for the protection that he gives us. Praying to God for his grace and his mercy and his love. Praying to God for the nation. Pray you can go on and on and on. So one of the reasons people lose patience is they stop praying. They stop praying. We need to be a praying people. Another reason that people lose patience, let's look at Galatians chapter 9. I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 6, verse number 9. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Again, I encourage everybody, I'm pretty sure everybody that's here tonight comes to Rod's Bible studies on uh, Sunday mornings at 930. And you hear him speak often about people that have left the church. They've left the church. Well, it rarely happens that somebody wakes up one morning and decides, I'm done with the church. There's usually a pattern. There's steps that happen. One of them, they stop praying. Two, they grew weary in doing well. This is a marathon that we're in. It is grueling from time to time. Life is difficult just in case you guys haven't figured that out already. Life is difficult and we can grow weary but we need to keep our focus as I said this morning on the prize, on the goal and that prize is heaven. Some fail to remain faithful. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 6 and verse number 11. Hebrews 6 and verse 11. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end. The difficult part is until the end. M most of us in here have been Christians for a number of years. And it can be challenging. 
to remain faithful, to have that full assurance of faith that is necessary. We know that we don't always have it. I've heard people say, well, you should never question God. Why? We don't know everything. There are things that take place in our life or in the world or in the lives of others where we're looking and we're questioning. It's not a question because we're looking for an opportunity to not obey God, but to try to come to some understanding of why is this happening. Twelve years, Diana had cancer. Why? You don't think that the thought came up, why, in any of our heads, let alone the family? Why is this happening? Why, why 12 years? We don't know. God knew. We did not. So how does patience begin? How do we get patience? Again, if you pray for patience, God will give you opportunities to be patient. Patience begins with obedience. Our obedience. We make a decision to be patient. It's a decision. You make a decision to be angry. So if you can make a decision to be angry, you can make a decision to be patient. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. We need to make sure that we are steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. In order to gain the victory, we must be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's 1 Corinthians 15 and 58. Steadfast, immovable, always abounding, always in good times, in bad times, when we have a lot of money, when we have no money, when our health is good, when our health is poor. We need to be steadfast, we need to be immovable literally just rocks and rock solid. We need to be faithful unto death. Faithful unto death. If you would turn over to Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 10. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. What if that were said to us tonight? Think about it. Do not fear what you, what we are about to suffer. And they did suffer. The devil is about to throw us into prison. It might be a little bit more difficult to be steadfast and immovable unto the end when, when this is the persecution that you're going through. We, we have little to no persecution in this nation. Let's look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23. It says, if indeed you continue in the faith, 
stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Continue in the faith. Again, when things are going well, that's an easy thing to do. When persecution comes, when trials come, it is more difficult. Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 17. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 17. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. Warning after warning. Obedience is coupled with a promise. Our obedience is coupled with a promise. Let's go back to Revelation, this time chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Verse 21. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Visualize that. The one who conquers. Jesus will grant that person to sit with him on his throne. You know, as a kid, I remember how excited I was. I remember how excited our kids were. I remember how excited my grandkids get when they have the opportunity to take a picture with Santa. And you're standing in that long line, and they can't wait to get up there and sit with Santa Claus. Imagine Jesus saying to you, Come sit with me on my throne. That is just a beautiful picture to me. And then Revelation 21, Revelation 21 and verse number 7. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God and he will be my son. Our patience, our obedience, puts us in this position. Second point, patience continues with edification. Paul is an example for us. Look at what he went through and remained patient. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 11. We're not going to read the whole thing, but 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'll read a little bit, beginning in verse 24. And as we're reading this, think about all the things you've suffered. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in dangers from rivers. Dangers from robbers. Danger from my own people. Danger from Gentiles. Danger in the city danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, and it goes on.
What dangers have we faced? High winds in the desert, right? Our gas light came on when we were coming to church. I mean, seriously, what? I make light of it, but I think because we don't have the persecution, that we become lackadaisical in some ways. Because our faith is really costing us nothing. Nothing's going to happen to us. Again, the worst thing that usually happens is people will stop being your friends. You won't get invited over, right? You won't. That, that's pretty much the worst thing that generally happens in our country. His attitude, and this needs to be our attitude, Galatians 2.20, crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20. Again, this is Paul speaking of himself. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's a great response to when somebody asks you, why are you a Christian? Why are you a Christian? The latter part of what he said. I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. His expectation, having patience. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 through 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Edification. We have that, or we should have that same outlook, that there is a crown of life for us. And then Romans 8 Romans chapter 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger? or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's nothing in this world that can separate us from our God except us. Nobody can separate me. I can choose to separate myself. Sadly, there are many people who have chosen to separate themselves. But there is nothing 
in this creation, it says, that can separate us from our God. The confidence that that should instill in us. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Hebrews 12, verse 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. We often grow weary and we often grow faint-hearted. We should not, because we have this Christ who died for us. Point number three, patience finishes the trial. Patience finishes the trial. Second Timothy 3.12, Christians are going to be persecuted. Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Well, all of us are striving to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. We are going to be persecuted. If you haven't been already, it's coming. It's coming if you remain faithful. Let's look at James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. <clears throat> James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. It takes a trial to make Christians perfect or complete in Christ. It takes a trial. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete Lacking nothing. We become perfect and we become complete when we go through the trials. When he heats us up and the dross comes to the top and he scoops it out and he puts it to the side and then he heats it up again and more dross comes out. And just when you think he can't heat you up anymore and more dross comes out, guess what? It's going to happen again until we are perfect. Well, what about Father Abraham? Without Father Abraham, we wouldn't be where we are today. No father Abraham without get out of thy country. Right? Unto a land that I will show you. That's Genesis 12 and verse 1. There's no prophet Moses without Moses standing before Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 5 and verse 1. 
or in the wilderness wanderings. There's no Joshua without the battle of Canaan. There's no David without Goliath and his flights from Saul. There's no Daniel without the lions. There's no apostles without persecution. And there is no Jesus without the cross. So this evening we looked at patience. We need to be obedient. We need to have edification, and we need to have trials. It is through these that we develop our patience. Some of us are fast learners. Some of us, it only takes one or two trials before you figure it out. I'm a brickhead. I'm a slow learner. And sadly, it takes me a lot of time sometimes to figure things out. It's a detriment to me. Um, just this afternoon, I forget the brother's name. He asked me how things were going. I said, things are going pretty well. And I said, but I'm always expecting something to take place. And my view of trials in my life that's the way I view it, is that there is something that I'm holding on to. That God is trying to get out of me, or there's something I don't have in me that he needs in me. That's why I think he puts us through trials. He needs us to be that perfect person. And it doesn't happen overnight. And it takes a long time for some of us. It's taken a long time for me. And I'm not there yet, but I am pressing on towards that call, of the upward call in Christ Jesus. If there's anyone here tonight that has yet to obey the gospel, I would encourage you. The word of God commands you. Again, if there's anyone here that's in the body that needs the help, the prayers, uh, anything that the church can do, please come forward as we stand and as we sing.